What's going on guys, this is Rob, and after watching X-Men 97 episode number 5, I wanted it to be Cassandra Nova, but as so many of you guys pointed out, it's probably not Cassandra Nova, because Cable said he is coming, and it wouldn't make any sense to refer to a Sentinel as he, because a Sentinel's a robot, it's neither a man or a woman, it might have those features, but it's a machine, right? Machines don't have personalities. But a lot of you guys also pointed out that in the Life Death episode with Storm and Forge, there were a boatload of Easter eggs and one of those Easter eggs showed the character of Bastion. And this video is going to prove that it is Bastion. I had to dig through the memory banks to find this comic, so I better see some thanks down in the comments section. So this is actually Machine Man Bastion from 1998. And what it does is it largely centers on a conflict between Bastion and Cable. Cable trying to prevent Bastion from, you know, doing his whole thing. But this is all going to fit in perfectly with X-Men 97. So once Cable is effectively subdued by Bastion, what he does is he tells this story, right? He gives us like these set of events that really go all the way back to Days of Future Past. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Days of Future Past, I will say how it transpired in X-Men, the animated series with Bishop is totally different from the comics, but the overall gist remains the same and we'll make sense of it as we go on. But Bastion says the United States government having failed in its mission to neutralize the mutant infestation entrusted the task to the robotic sentinels who found success where their creators could not. Most mutants were at last contained, but there were those who would not be so easily suppressed. Rebels who would not conform to Sentinel rule. Measures had to be taken. And he says, to this end, a new breed of Sentinel was manufactured, the Nimrod Hunter series. Its purpose, to be more accurate, more efficient, more deadly. Even the X-Men of that era lost most of their number before the might of these newly constructed engines of destruction, proving the role of the renegade mutant hero to be most suicidal in nature. So he's referencing Days of Future Past. In Marvel Comics, the way the Days of Future Past transpired is that you had Mystique and her Brotherhood of Evil Mutants who assassinated Senator Robert Kelly, Maura McTaggart, and Professor Charles Xavier. They did that in order to prove the point that mutants were not to be trifled with. You got the exact opposite, that what happened is Congress tried to pass the Mutant Registration Act, but because mutants are considered sovereign citizens of the United States, it was deemed by the U.S. Supreme Court that the Mutant Registration Act infringed on their civil liberties, so it was struck down. What ended up happening instead is the United States government basically restarted the Sentinel program and handed the whole thing over to Stephen Lang. No relation to Scott Lang. The nature of Sentinels is they started with Bolivar Trask, he was defeated, Stephen Lang took over, and those are the Sentinels that you're the most familiar with. Following that, Days of Future Past just transpired. Every superhero operated operating in North America, Fantastic Four, Avengers, the whole nine yards, the X-Men, they were either killed or captured, and inhibitor collars were slapped on their necks in order to prevent them from being able to use their powers, and then they were just thrown into internment camps, just waiting for execution, and that was it. But the Nimrod Sentinel that he's referring to is the idea that there were some mutants out there that managed to evade captivity, and given the level of power that they had, that they could easily overcome virtually any number of Sentinels. So the Nimrod series was designed for the purpose of being able to not only sense what a mutant's power is, but to automatically develop countermeasures to those powers and then neutralize the mutant threat. And so that's why he says, but those intrepid mutants were as unrelenting as their modern age counterparts and sought to send one of their members back into the past in hopes of preventing the future from coming into being. Now, of course, what he's talking about here is the ending to Days of Future Past, that Rachel Summers, who is the daughter of Jean Grey and Cyclops from that Days of Future Past future, that she sent the mind of Kitty Pride into the past to keep Days of Future Past from happening. It's a lot of instances of the word past. The bigger point here is that because the Days of Future Past timeline was the guaranteed future, by preventing it, that future now just became an alternate reality because it was stopped. It's how Marvel solved the issue of like the paradox, right? How do you stop a future that doesn't happen? And so following that, you got a story that was actually called Days of Future Present, where as far as Rachel Summers was concerned, she didn't realize she was now in an alternate reality. And so for her, the future just kept going on. Days of Future Past never ended. So she travels back to the present day. What happens is Nimrod 
follows her back. And that's how you get Nimrod in the modern era in Marvel Comics. But this is what Bastion's referencing. He says, having lived in the future yourself, you are aware of how entirely possible it is for one with the proper technology to traverse the streams of time. Nimrod on the trail of this fugitive X-Man found itself in a remote past where Sentinels had not yet usurped authority from the Homo sapiens, with your kind moving about unchecked. In effect, Nimrod's past is our present, right? Because Days of Future Past happened some number of decades into the future. And so he says Nimrod had no alternative but to fulfill its original directive, that and no other. But the history of these man-made sentinels begins not at the onset of the next millennium, but rather toward the final days of this one. And this is where we start getting into X-Men 97, because what you'll notice is a lot of what's being talked about here is really the basis for X-Men the Animated Series, Master Mold, the Sentinels, Nimrod in that cartoon, the whole nine yards. What he says here is Homo sapiens superior, humans born with superhuman traits had risen to the genetic forefront of humanity and along with them came the precursor of all Sentinels that were to follow the master mold. Even then, its simple cybernetic mind reasoned that it was humanity itself which stood in the way of the purging of mutant kind. And so the master mold defied the plans of its own creator, the late Dr. Bolivar Trask. And that's exactly what happened in the comics, right? That was adapted to X-Men the Animated Series. Do you remember in the show where you had the scene with Bolivar Trask where master mold wanted to replace Trask's brain with a computer? And Trask's like, no, 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 you know, you're supposed to be going after mutants and Master Mold says that's illogical. Mutants are humans, and so he wanted to attack everybody. That's exactly how it played out in the comics, right? So it's like a one-to-one -one adaptation almost. And so Bastion says, but the original Master Mold nearly set a precedent that would recur in subsequent series when it rebelled against the original programming and determined to bring about the complete and utter subjugation of the far too tolerant humans with its army of non-sentience. It was only the intervention of the original team of X-Men that halted that first insurgents of automatons. Now what's being referenced here is the first time or really the first few times that the X-Men ever fought Sentinels in Marvel Comics, which was largely during the era of like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby when they were creating the X-Men. Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Roy Thomas, Gary Friedrich, Arnold Drake, so on and so forth. But basically everything before Chris Claremont came on as writer, if you understand the significance of his time and taking over the X-Men in the mid 1970s. But Bastion goes on to say, there were a number of subsequent mutant hunting endeavors, culminating in a project spearheaded by a government scientist named Stephen Lang, in which an all new, all different group of X-Men battled a new series of Sentinels, manufactured to simulate an earlier version of their own team. Lang was believed to have sacrificed his human life in the service of the greater good, though his well-intentioned plans were to meet with failure in the end. This is the fight that the X-Men had that led to the original Phoenix Saga. And what I mean by that is, again, referencing Project Wide Awake here, which I don't think was referenced in X-Men the Animated Series, but is certainly going to be something that you'll likely see over the course of the first season going to the end of X-Men 97, Project Wide Awake was just a massive government program, right? Containing control mutant threats, spanned multiple presidencies, governmental intelligence organizations, state and local sheriff's offices, the whole nine yards. But where Bolivar Trask had been defeated by the original X-Men and Marvel, his entire Sentinel program was taken away by the federal government and handed over to Stephen Lang. And Stephen Lang developed the modern Sentinels that you're the most familiar with. That's what this is referencing here. And so Bastion goes on to say, when a man dies, his dreams die along with him. But the machine, the machine can live on as if immortal. And the unremitting assault was resumed. Nimrod found that the timeline he traveled back into in his attempt to eliminate the threat of the modern day X-Men was an interesting one indeed. Events had long since begun to herald the inevitable reality from whence he came. Events that led to the dawn of a newly fashioned master mold, housing the brain ingrams of the now comatose Stephen Lang, whose defeat at the hands of Iceman and the Angel 
a small faction of the original X-Men, and the gamma irradiated behemoth known as the Hulk was but another minor setback in the inevitable scheme of things. Resistance, as always, proves futile in the end. Now, something that I do want to specify here as we kind of go through the rest of this, that in effect, Bastion had essentially taken over a character by the name of Aaron Stack, also known as Machine Man. He's literally a robot that desires to be human and in some ways has achieved a lot of success in doing so but that's basically the guy that you see like attacking cable right that looks like a human with a purple suit that's Aaron Stack is really all it is so you'll notice that but that's not really overly significant here I would however invite you to look at the fight between cable and Aaron Stack is what would likely be events that transpire when we get the whole explanatory episode in X-Men 97, that Aaron Stack would likely be replaced by Bishop or potentially even Forge. So that's just something to keep in the back of your head as we kind of go through the rest of this. But Bastion says how ironic it was that Nimrod, the Omega in the Sentinel series, should find its destiny linked with that of the original, the Alpha Sentinel, the Master Mold, because that is what occurred when Hunter found himself being assimilated into the resurrected Master Mold, which lay dormant until the moment of physical contact with his automated antecedent. Now, this all actually took place in Uncanny X-Men 247? I want to say 247 or 274, but I want to say it's 247. But he says, in what was to be its first and final conflict with the X-Men, this master mold Nimrod Amalgam found itself wrenched through a pan-dimensional portal created by a mystical amulet referred to as the Siege Perilous. Because of its unnatural synthesis with its far-flung future descendant, the Master Mold deemed itself a mutant and thereby self-destructed as it was swept up by the amulet's vortex winds. But before they could completely disperse, its inorganic systems had already begun reintegrating into something else, something entirely different. According to the occult lore of this world, any and all who cross the boundaries of this siege perilous are said to be judged by the higher powers of the universe and then returned to the earth in harmonic fashion. For the Master Mold, for Nimrod, for the first and last in a nearly indefectible line of synthetic intellects, it meant being stripped of all artificiality. The machine was made flesh. This is, in effect, the origin of Bastion. Now, what does all this mean? So the idea here is that in the old Uncanny X-Men comic, right, which I will say I think is 247, that basically Master Mold and Nimrod had literally merged, and they looked dope. Right? It looked really, really cool. But what all the X-Men and everybody had realized is they couldn't overcome the power of Master Mold and Nimrod. So as a follow-up to a story called The Fall of the Mutants, they invoked the Siege Perilous. What does that mean? So you guys know how right now in X-Men 97, you have Forge and Storm and the arrival of the adversary. That is a whole story in Marvel, right? Like it is the fall of the mutants, the quote unquote death of the X-Men. The way it played out is that the adversary is just this demonic being who's astronomically powerful and was almost successful in conquering the earth and even potentially conquering the universe. Although that was more theorized than anything else. What it took was Forge using the essences of the X-Men and Madeline Pryor to a essentially send the adversary back into its portal, but the X-Men were essentially killed off. What you ended up getting is the X-Men receiving the Siege Perilous as an artifact, literally an amulet, that if they ever got tired of being superheroes, they could pass through it. Normally the Siege Perilous is like the size of a necklace, right? Like something that you see around somebody's neck. But when it's used, it can grow to like varying sizes. When you pass through the Siege Perilous, as ambiguous as it is, you really are quote unquote judged by the universe's higher powers. You never really get an explanation, anything more than that, but the big takeaway is that when you come out of the Siege Perilous, your life is effectively restarted, but it happens in different ways. Some people remember their past, others don't, but you start off with like a new job and a whole new career and all that kind of stuff, right? So to give you perspective here, imagine like at the end of Spider-Man No Way Home, instead of Doctor Strange casting a spell that made everybody forget who Peter Parker was, he just like was given the Siege Perilous by Doctor Strange and then it opened to a giant portal, Peter walked through it, and the next thing he knows, he's in an apartment in Manhattan that looks like trash. That's how the Siege Perilous works. 
right, by all standards of measurement. And so following this, Bastion was taken in by a woman named Rose. And while he didn't know his own past, while he didn't realize that he's a combination of Master Mold and Nimrod combined into one, he still says she reached out to him like a mother to a son. Where there were no foundations, new groundwork was laid. Where there had been no home, one was now provided. Where there had been no love, there was now a spark, but even love would not stave off what was to come. Even love cannot shield a man from the harsh realities of the world. He would view the reports that were televised nightly. He would read the headlines for himself. The media's message was unmistakable. The threat posed by Homo Superior, by mutants, was far greater than their genetic forebears had ever imagined, right? Humanity is basically who he's talking about. Mutants were more dangerous than anybody ever considered. The message touched upon something buried deep within the man, making him resonate with an emotion that he had not learned from Rose, a feeling that made him want to take desperate action. Eventually, he could bear it no longer, and realizing that Rose's future was no longer tied to his own, he left her side, sacrificing everything he had gained. Now, this is where we also kind of start diving back into X-Men 97, because while Forge's history in that show is very, very ambiguous, what we do know is that he was part of a special government program tasked with the purpose of essentially containing and controlling mutants. He was part of Project Wide Awake. Even if he didn't fully understand what he was doing, that's what he was part of. He didn't really grasp the full echelon of it, and it makes sense because Project Wide Awake was highly compartmentalized. Things like Weapons Plus were part of Project Wide Awake. But what Bastion did in striking out into the world with this intense anti-mutant sentiment, which was really more a result of his programming effectively manifesting again, is he started making allies. Guys like Great and Creed, who were staunchly anti-mutant. You remember Graydon Creed from X-Men the Animated Series, the guy who led the Friends of Humanity. These were the kind of people that Bastion was associating with. You see how all of this can literally just bookend to X-Men the Animated Series. Bastion has been here the entire time. He's been the one manipulating behind the scenes the entire time. We just never realized it until right now with X-Men 97 and specifically the life death episode that we saw with Storm and Forge and all the little Easter eggs. And so what he says here is he says, each player is required to bring something to a partnership. The man had no fortune. For him, there was little more than the unfathomable nightmares that haunted him night after night. Nightmares that began to reveal a higher calling, a greater purpose, a destiny that would one day be made manifest. Day after day, he would observe the nameless, faceless masses as they went about their worthless routines, apparently unconcerned about the mutant horde that would eventually rise up to annihilate them. But he knew what mankind could not. He was special, superior to all of them, and now it would be his duty to be their shepherd. The wolves, after all, were lurking, but his was a knowledge that would also bring power, knowledge enough to create the detailed technical blueprints that would be submitted to Graydon Creed, the information that the man brought with him plans for a more advanced breed of sentinels which would be able to stamp out mutant kind forever was soon utilized by a division of government technicians who began to build a new master mold, taking the man's theories and concepts and advancing them. Now, let's take this and apply it to X-Men 97. We have not gotten an explanation for how the Friends of Humanity were able to reverse engineer Sentinels. You could just say Bastion was the guy behind it. You see how it all ties together, man. I told you this video was going to prove that Bastion is the guy, man. Like, he's the dude. Now, what he says is the day that the man took the name Bastion was one of great import, for symbolically, he was just that. Humanity's last stronghold against an undeniable enemy. There were others, the handicapped, who came to the clinic seeking seemingly miraculous remedies, who sacrificed their lives never knowing the truth, though something far greater than truth was about to be bestowed upon them. So it was, Cable, that the feeble were reborn as prime sentinels, composites of man and metal, 
crude when compared to myself, but suitable nonetheless for the agenda which lay ahead. Operation Zero Tolerance was the war that would have rid mankind of Homo sapiens superior for all time, but as in the beginning, the humans made the same mistakes. On this occasion, the populace judged my actions as severely as it had when the master mold first defied Bolivar Trask so long ago. I was arrested and led away in shackles. The government pulled the plug. So literally, this just kind of outlines the entire story of Bastion, how he got to where he is, what it is that he's been doing. But when you start looking at this and you start applying it, not just to X-Men 97, but X-Men the animated series, when it comes to like the Sentinel program, when it comes to the Friends of Humanity, all these different groups, barring the few instances, right? What was it, Time Fugitives? When Graydon Creed had allied himself with Apocalypse, not knowing that it was Apocalypse, outside of a few things like that, it makes perfect sense that Bastion is the guy operating behind the scenes. He's the reason why the Friends of Humanity had learned to reverse engineer Sentinel technology. He was the one that was spearheading the project that Forge was a part of and creating collars based on advanced futuristic technology that could shut down mutant powers, that could deactivate mutant powers, suppress them, the whole nine yards, right? Like, this has all been Bastion the entire time. So let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Is this credible? Does it like solidify? Because if you have any other questions, I want to hear them, right? I want to know what they are. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.